Good afternoon or good morning, uh, depending where you are. Really excited to have uh, you all listening to this uh, uh, fascinating conversation about a really uh, big issue for the water industry on a global scale. Uh, thank you for uh, the 300 people who registered. So there's clearly really strong interest and um, demand uh, to, to listen to this webinar. Uh, it will be recorded. So if you have colleagues that aren't able to make this, please feel free to forward that on to them. There'll be an email that goes out uh, at the conclusion of this, uh, of this webinar. Um, we're going to uh, have, basically have an informal, relaxed chat between um, a couple of people who are very focused on this particular problem. Uh, David McLean is from Landis and Gear and Andrew Forster Knight is from Southeast Water. I'll do some intros uh, to them shortly. Uh, but at the end of uh, their uh, Q&A fireside chat, if you like, there'll be an opportunity for the audience to ask them specific questions. So please, uh, uh, send those through in the uh, in the chat in the Zoom, and um, they will be forwarded through for um, for me to ask them, put them um, uh, on the spot if you like. Uh, but this is intended to be a really open, informal, um, back and forth discussion between a water utility and uh, and um, a vendor that's trying to solve the same problem together. Uh, so non-revenue water, as we know, is a really, really big issue for all utilities and it, it varies between 5% to sometimes 50 to 60% in some parts of the world. Um, and uh, it's become uh, uh, politically untenable. There is really no commercial level of non-revenue water loss that's acceptable anymore from a social licence perspective, uh, but also it costs utilities uh, real, real money. And, uh, and in a, an environment where affordability is becoming increasingly difficult uh, to have your product, five to 50% of your product leaking out of the pipes every year is, is also really unacceptable. And there's uh, not a new problem. Uh, the industry has been trying to solve this for a very long time. What the industry really has struggled to do is to solve this, uh, this problem at scale and on a permanent basis. Uh, and so uh, Southeast Water really identified this as a really core issue for them. Uh, and in its digital utility journey, it, uh, it sought out to, uh, to find a technology that would solve that. And uh, they, uh, they believe that they have cracked the code on this and they have something that's a game changing capability. Uh, and uh, working closely with Landis and Gear have been able to make that accessible and affordable for uh, water utilities, uh, particularly in the Australia, New Zealand environment, but uh, uh, very interested in um, scaling this out at a global level as well, because it is a, a big global problem. So I'll do the introductions first and um, be kicking off with uh, David from Landis and Gear. David is the Vice President um, of Australia, New Zealand and South Asia for Landis and Gear. He has over 35 years of local and international utility metering experience, uh, previously leading the portfolio management team and market strategy. He's got a strong commercial focus and has been instrumental in spearheading smart deployments across, across Asia Pacific. His new responsibility would add more value to our webinar and uh, particularly when he's able to talk about the broader um, strategy of Landis and gear in, in water. So welcome, David, and thank you for your time. Thanks, Dan. Good. And uh, the other participant is Andrew Force tonight, who uh, is the um, general manager for digital utility at Southeast Water. And this is a really new role for uh, Southeast Water and for Andrew. And Andrew sits at the executive table at Southeast Water and he's really able through that role to, uh, to drive and, um, and pull uh, Southeast Water into its digital utility target state. And that means working across the business. Um, and the first uh, port of call for the digital utility transformation is really around digital metering and uh, not just the meters, um, the data, the platform, all the business processes and everything that impacts the business um, to make sure that, uh, that it gets carried out. Um, Andrew's previous role in Southeast Water was leading um, the operational technology group and so is really well placed to move into this role. 
Um, so before I hand over to David for the first question, um, just another gentle reminder, please, uh, as you hear the conversation and, and it sparks some interest or questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. And uh, I'll hand over to David at this point. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Um, look, I, I agree. We're, we're at a pivotal point, I think, um, as the water industry really embraces digitization and um, you, you, we have totally aligned around non-revenue water is a significant problem that needs to be addressed as we go forward. I think one of the things that we do know is that leak detection has been around for a while. It's not a new technology. Um, uh, so I'm interested, uh, I guess, Andrew, to understand why the SOTO network leak detection sensor is different. And I guess the benefits that this is that you're starting to see um, at Southeast Water from the use. Sure, thanks, Dave. So, so maybe just a bit of background for those that aren't quite across the technology we're talking about here. So the leak detection meter or the SOTO sensor that we're describing here is effectively a digital water meter. Um, it just happens to have embedded sensors, one of them being a vibration sensor for, or, or acoustic um, sensor for detecting leaks. So as you just said at the top, it's not a new technology to have acoustic detection. Acoustic detection for leak in water networks is has been around for decades. Um, so I guess the difference from traditional tech to the SOTO um, is that the traditional stuff is generally harder to scale across a full network for permanent monitoring, given the cost of the equipment, maintenance, and generally they have lower battery life. They're usually sort of data logging based equipment with lots of heavy processing, et cetera. So the SOTO sensor is, is sort of flips that on its head where every meter has the sensor in it and it's, and it's widely deployed. So with the SOTO, because it's integrated directly into a, a digital water meter, it leverages the long battery life and the existing comms network. And, and probably for us, one of the biggest benefits that we've found is that it's great at pinpointing leaks on service pipes, which is the, the pipe connecting a main to, to the customer. That's where the majority of the leaks and repair work take place um, in, our, in our network. So being able to find that easily and in advance is, is a real bonus for us. Um, and so just, just another way of putting it, I guess, is for those that know what a listening stick is, which is the traditional field technology where um, technicians will go out with a stick and, and basically listen for noise. We're effectively getting that at every meter, 24 by seven for 15 years or the life of a battery of a meter. So it's, it's a pretty compelling technology from that point of view. And, and based on what we've seen so far, we're, we're forecasting um, some pretty major non-revenue water savings on the back of, of the technology. Andrew, that's, that's a very interesting insight that you've just given us. Um, I think we now have quite a few thousand of the Lantern and Gear Smart Meters, the W350, with the integrated SOTO network leak detection in the field right across the Southeast Water Network. What are the learnings uh, from the data that you've collected um, that you're seeing and, and applying to, to the system that you have there? Yeah, look, we've had some great results from the initial trials and from the small trial areas, we selected, we deployed the SOTO meters on every house. So to really give it that density to see what this thing could do. And from that, we've been able to detect a wide range of leaks. And more importantly, it's, it's validated some of our assumptions that including that leaks can be detected days, weeks or months in advance of them coming to surface and being called in from customers. So that was, that was pretty good to have that compelling evidence behind it. Um, we also got great evidence showing distribution mains leaking for a long time before they eventually burst. Again, that, that it's widely thought that, that that happens, but now we've got really clear evidence. And as we gather more and more data, we'll be able to uh, categorize main failures and how long they leak before they burst, depending on pipe material and a whole heap of other parameters. So really promising from that point of view. And all of this sort of new information gives us opportunities in the future to optimize the way we structure our maintenance activities. So for example, because from a desktop perspective, we will be able to know every morning, we'll, let, we'll know where all the leaks are potentially in our network, if this is widely deployed and, and we'll be able to prioritize them. And on the back of that, we'll be able to batch up the jobs and deploy fit for purpose crews to repair them much more efficiently. So we're not doing that yet just because we haven't deployed to scale, but that's our end goal for this. So at the moment we're doing a lot of um, visual ad hoc analysis, which is great. And it, gives, it tells us where all the leaks are, but as we scale that that's not going to fly really. So we'll have to have sort of machine learning and other things that's, 
that will um, spit out basically where the areas hotspots of activity are and then we can optimize our our crews around that um, this will also be a much better customer experience as we'll be turning up to do the repair often before the customer is even aware of the issue so yeah that, that will be a great result as well and and you, you asked just on those trials just some more info i guess um, we've done some relatively deep dive on the data which is you know there's a lot of data around the work activity the leaks and the pipe network and configuration and based on that and what we're extrapolating we, we are pretty confident that we can reduce our non-revenue water by about one percent if we have these sort of meters deployed across our network so that one percent might not sound a lot but that is that's quite significant and it's got a whole host of benefits for the whole overall business case of doing digital metering but more importantly it's it's about water efficiency and scarcity where we'll be able to save that water so the, the savings that i'm talking about will come through early detection of leaks um, which which i guess uh, speaks for itself and as well as being able to find leaks that never come to surface so those ones that do never get called in but are obviously out there we think we'll be able to go after those ones in terms of um the question we often get is how many do you need to deploy to get all these great results so this, the density depends on a lot, quite a few factors of that pipe material etc but because the vast majority of our maintenance activities are on those service pipes, like I mentioned earlier, and we know that the SOTO, regardless of pipe material, can detect a leak on a service pipe. I'm of the view, and, and my team's forming the view, that um, we want to put these out as widely as we can just because of that contextual information for a small incremental price gives us a great uh, deal of information for the next decade or so. So it's a, an opportunity we think we don't want to miss. So hopefully that's a bit of a summary of, of the trials we've done so far. That answered your question, Dave? Yeah, I think that's, that yep. gives us a good insight. Um, I think I think one of the things just to, to talk about Landis and Gear's involvement uh, in smart water, it's, it's a significant strategic focus for us um, at a global level. Um, we are, Landis and Gear has really three pillars around smart metering, intelligence and smart infrastructure. And, and this fits uh, really across all, all those three parts um, from a device perspective, um, from the meter itself. And then uh, it also connects into uh, being a more intelligent device as we've heard uh, with the leak, uh, sort of network leak sensing and detection. And then also a much more richer experience from a data perspective uh, improving infrastructure um, for for water companies. So it's it's really a core part of our business. I think cool. Landis and Geary, uh, you know, is showing its investment in the water industry uh, at a global level. Um, actually, early this year, Landis uh, finalised the purchase of another smart metering company that does both electricity and water, uh, a company called Luna, based out of Turkey. And you know that's adding to our our position globally into uh, the strategic area of smart water. Uh, in addition to that, we continue to invest uh, in the uh, data analytics, and and we'll talk a bit more about that uh, a bit probably a bit later on uh, during this session. But coming back to a more local perspective, um, I'd just like to remind everyone on this call that actually. Uh, the Landis and Gear business today under a, a, pr a previous brand, the old email metering brand, is no stranger to water in the Australian and New Zealand markets. In fact, at one stage, uh, we're a local market leader around the time of positive displacement mechanical meters. And we've decided to now re-enter the market uh, in this phase of transition to digitization for smart water. We see it's a, the right time and spearheading that is our W350 product market that is smart in itself. And with the addition of the SOTO network leak detection uh, brings a much richer uh, experience for not just network uh, water network companies, but also consumers uh, as, as Andrew's talked about. And so I think it's a really uh, important part for us. And David, we, we obviously, just from what I've said earlier, we, we believe in, in sort of this technology about having embedded sensors, et cetera. What, what are you seeing? What's Landis in gear seeing in terms of adoption across Australia, New Zealand? Are there others that are interested in this or are we sort of out on our own a little bit? Yeah, um, I, I think Southeast Water is definitely leading the pack in this area. 
However, you're not alone. We've actually uh, already have a number of other utilities uh, trialing the network leak detection uh, sensor. Um, and in particular, we can mention some uh, over in New Zealand, particularly water care, Wellington Water. I've got trials underway and there are a number of other utilities uh, also in Australia that are looking to start trials uh, in the very near future. And I think this is really significant uh, because we're starting to see the journey from uh, standalone devices in the water industry into this digital transformation. Um, and they're embracing it. And I think they are starting to see uh, the benefits that will drive their business cases in the near future. Great, thanks. I think what we've seen, as I said before, uh, Landis and Gear is not new to digitalization. Uh, we've worked with many utilities around the world uh, in their transformation journey. Uh, and working with some of these large customers uh, in different locations, um, each customer has sometimes unique needs. Um, I guess, Andrew, uh, in, in SEW's case, what were the key technology principles and the requirements um, for Southeast Water uh, to drive you down this path? Okay, yeah, look, from the early days of our digital program, which has been going on for probably seven years or so now, um, we had some key strategic principles around our technology choices. We had vendors as well that wanted us to um, you know, make a decision, if you, if you like, because we couldn't keep sitting on the fence they needed to make investments etc so we were pretty keen to make some solid decisions and have some um, investment logic behind those so in terms of some principles um, I guess one is that we wanted to leverage global open standards so that there was no vendor lock-in which is you know we've, we've had in the past we really wanted to break that and we also felt that this would be the best ecosystem for innovation we I guess we don't want to have to build everything we want to be able to import innovation and having a global open standards based system we thought would allow us to do that so this, this sort of led to us choosing parts of our tech stack, like our, the comms network or the low power wide area. We chose MBIOT, which is a cellular comms. Um, so for those that are aware of that one, it's secure, it's a global standard. It's part of 5G and, and we think it'll be future proof or there for the long haul for us. Um, we also wanted to stick to our knitting a little bit. We didn't want to have to build out radio towers and things, which we, we looked at in the early days and then we thought, you know, what's our core business? And it was really about getting the data to, to transform our business rather than trying to run, run the networks ourselves. So we've, we've outsourced that to the telcos. I guess the other, another technology choice or a principle was to that point on open standards is we, we use this lightweight M2M -M protocol, which is effectively the data protocol and how the device is managed, um, which I guess goes to a principle around, and you touched on it earlier, David, but wanting to treat the meter more as a device than a, a, a traditional meter. So allowing for multiple sensors in the future um, rather than just flow and obviously vibration and soto is a key one. We've also got pressure and other things on, on the horizon. So um, yeah, that's probably a, a, a principle there. So the, the tech choices we made allowed things like soto to interface to the Southeast water system. So that worked well, even before we did use soto, some of those tech decisions just naturally, uh, you know, grease the wheels if you like to, to make that happen. Um, Another principle, I guess, was just around the meter itself. We, we were pretty keen on using static meters for, for a host of reasons, but for those that um, aren't across, static meter means no moving parts, so effectively ultrasonic meters compared to your traditional mechanical um, meter. So we, we felt that sort of advancement would allow things like Soto and others to come to the fore because all of a sudden you've got processing power on board and you've got real estate to put extra sensors etc so more of that edge-based processing which yeah we, we sort of foresaw that that will be a big, big uh, play for us in the future and lastly we wanted to have a cloud first architecture that would scale as our device deployment scaled so rather than having the traditional way which is a large upfront sunk cost that are typically associated with traditional on-premise systems we wanted the system to grow as we grew and, and we got our iot strategy in place and, and worked out all these new wonderful applications that we're going to use. Um, so we're using the, the Lentic platform, which is a Microsoft Azure based uh, system to manage and visualize this new digital network that we've got. And whilst obviously we're talking very heavily about meters at, at the moment and today, it's it's very much an IOT play. So 
That same technology will be for when we're monitoring um, the wastewater network or treatment plants, et cetera. It'll all come through that same common infrastructure, which makes life really easy for, for the people operating it. So yeah, there are a few, few of the principles that we, we got behind. And David, maybe a question for you, if hopefully I've, I've sort of answered that one in terms of the principles, but I guess from a practical point of view, one of the things that um, as we're trying to get this off the ground and many others are as well, that we're struggling with is supply chain. And I'm sure it's no, no surprise to you, but um, obviously shortages during the pandemic have taken a hit and it's really hard to get components, et cetera. What's LNG doing to mitigate this for your customers who want to get up and running in deployments, but I guess don't want to have to wait years to, to get their stuff. Yeah, that's, uh, it's, uh, it is right now a very challenging role for supply chain globally. And I think we, we all see this both in our personal and business lives, uh, being able to get uh, devices, components available uh, at the right time. Um, I think every company has a different view to this, but Landis Gear being a, a significant large business, we have many strategic uh, suppliers and we work very closely with them uh, through our procurement uh, team, uh, which is spread across the globe to try and mitigate these risks um, on, on being able to get components at the right time. Um, one of the key things that we've, we did early on uh, as we saw this is to extend our forecasting to ensure that we had uh, a bit of visibility and to bring in long lead time components um, so that are available at the right time uh, so that we can continue to supply to, to, to the market. Uh, and to customers such as yourself. Um, some of the other things that we are doing um, in, in over the top to ensure uh, more timely delivery of meters, um, we're in fact also further developing our, our local infrastructure uh, here in Australia uh, by extending and, and installing uh, water test equipment uh, certified to ISO 17025 that will enable us to uh, remove any bottlenecks before product comes to market through local validation and so that we can deliver meters faster to customers uh, as, as they come into the marketplace. Um, and I know that's been some issues in the past uh, that we've seen in the market and, you know, Landis and Gear wants to be ahead of those issues um, and so that we can, you know, have a, a much tighter relationship with our customers. The, the other thing, and, you know, we, we're working with this SEW uh, around this as well is coming back to those forecasts. Um, as we get the forecasts in, we can lock in component supply um, and then we can ensure that we have on-time uh, deliveries as per uh, our customer schedules. Um, you know, it is a difficult time, um, and, uh, but we're all working together and we will, we will deliver um, as, as, as the market uh, requires uh, for, these, for these sort of rollout programs. Um, and I think it's just a, it's a way that we have to work side by side uh, with suppliers uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and vendors uh, in a partnership approach to get through this. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've, we've had a probably uh, you know, two years of COVID. Um, we are seeing some light at the end of the tunnel in, in the future, not in the too close future, but uh, we are seeing some some benefits, and, and that's through the forecasting that we have been doing um, uh, through this period. Uh, we will eventually get through it, and and supply chains will return to normal. Um, but uh, I believe Landis and Gear is is doing a, a a good job to ensure continued product supply to to yourselves and to the to the rest of the market um, in that area. Um, look, I think the uh, the discussion this morning has been quite interesting. Um, and it's, it's given us some, some insights to what, uh, let's say what uh, Southeast Water is, has been doing. Um, but I, I would just sort of, maybe one last question to you, Andrew, uh, maybe before we go to uh, question uh, and answer time. Um, in our current world, you talked about, you know, digital devices, it's more than just the, the device itself. It's, it's the complete end-to-end -end IoT solution um, I think these are increasing in our networks. Where do you think that the, I guess, the advanced sensors that we have in the networks will take us to in the future? 
Yeah, thanks, Dave. Look, obviously hard, hard to question to answer, I guess, to, to sort of forecast that, but I'll, I'll give you my take on it. I think the next frontier will be around water quality. Um, so things like chlorine residual conductivity, turbidity being integrated directly into meters, um, I guess, with a view to allow us to trace water quality events throughout the network. Um, this would help us obviously get ahead of those um, and allow us to better inform our customers and manage it. So I think there's that's a step that's not too far away. I think the, the sensor technology is definitely getting there. I think the limitations on things like that are getting to some solid state sensors. I think the existing sensors in the market, you know, they need maintenance, they need cleaning, et cetera. So it's really sort of flipping the script on that and getting that solid state maintenance free long life sensors which i don't think we're quite there yet but no doubt people are working on it i'm i'm well aware in the in the industry that people are working on this so i'm sure once that's cracked that will be probably the next frontier um i think another one i mentioned that we already have pressure sensors in the meters and they they that has a host of applications that are proving really uh, valuable but i, I think a future step for that could be some high frequency pressure measurement. So measuring pressure transients. So for those that are not aware of that, that's these pressure waves that, that occur in really short bursts across the network and really disrupt the network. They they're large, can be largely invisible. And the reason we want to detect them is because we want to calm our network. We want to have it so that it's not fluctuating massively in pressure because that can cause asset failures, um, premature asset failures, which is there's a big problem across across the industry. So that's that's something I see uh, where that those sort of sensors would head. And then lastly, I, I guess we talk we've talked about this these things being devices rather than the meters, and and they're basically computers at, at the edge now. Um, and so what else can we do with them? So one of the things which I think we'll definitely get there, it's just not quite there now, is that end use um, data analysis. So that processing at the edge that for example, can disaggregate appliance usage in your house um, to show customers exactly where they're where and when they're using their water. So for example, you might get a, a pie chart on your bill showing there's X amount that's gone to shower, X to washing machine, dishwasher, et cetera. So more about that customer uh, engagement and behavior change. So I think um, with some the progression in, in sort of some of those algorithms that you can see that put, push down to the edge, I think, that that's going to be a really interesting space uh, in the next few years. That's um, excellent uh, chat. Really, really interesting there. And I, I'm just going to throw one question to you, Andrew, before uh, we open up to the to the Q and A from our um, our listeners. But uh, you know, you can't put this stuff in without getting a uh, return on the other side of the, the ledger. So from a business case perspective, uh, what drove Southeast Water to, to look at this in the digital meter? Um, and, and what does that look like from a business case perspective? Yeah, really good question, Dan. So our business case, which we're obviously developing to, to sort of get this up is really premised on water efficiency. And there's only, there's a couple of ways that you can uh, decrease demand and, and one is customer behavior which we're absolutely going to try and do with uh, digital meters and lots of engagement and some new new initiatives off, off that the other one is obviously non-revenue water so for us to go after that non-revenue water we just sort of discussed at the top what the options are and you know there is has been existing technology but in our view um it's not financially ready to scale or from a maintenance and all those other reasons i mentioned so for us, we see a incremental cost to a digital meter to get this massive deployment of leak detection sensors across the network and all that brings with it in terms of optimized maintenance and getting to leaks before they burst and all those really cool things. That's what stacks up for us. So we're offsetting the water we're going to save, which is multi-million dollars of value and cost to us and to our customers. If we can pair that back a little bit with an investment upfront in, in sort of the digital tech, it it um it, it stands up for itself i won't sort of go into the numbers but it, it from that metric it stands up from a cost benefit analysis so hopefully that's answered your question there Dan. yeah it does and um i think probably the really big test for for us will be in our uh, next pricing submission so um southeast water is uh is planning to um 
to have uh, digital metering in its its next five year pricing period, with uh, with the Soto being a really big feature of that, um, in order to um, uh, to capture those non revenue water savings. So, um, uh, you know, the regulator is pretty pretty tough judge of economic value, and um, uh, we uh, we're really keen to um, to roll this out throughout our network. Um, so, there's been some fantastic questions that have come through, and thank you all for those. Um, I'll, uh, some of them will be re more relevant for, for others between yourself, David and Andrew, but um, I'll just start with the first one. Um, and uh, uh, it is, do you use some kind of triangulation from multiple metres with sodos in them, embedded in them, to really hone in on where that leak is? So how, how does that, move, how do you move from identification of a leak to actual location of the leak and maybe give an idea of how um, what the degree of accuracy of that is using Soto. Sure, I, I can take that one. If that's for me, Dan, I can answer that one. Um, yeah, so the Sotos are, and the sensor is built to be obviously relatively low cost. And um, whilst it's, it's complex, it's not doing any correlation. So the meters aren't talking to each other to try and pinpoint leaks and things like that. But because of the density, which is you know, effectively one on every house and the information that gets sent back each meter. So if there's a leak in the street, each meter will hear it, hear the noise to a um, different degree. And so from a, a basic heat map or some basic data algorithm that we run across the top, we can immediately pinpoint the source or the very likely source of that issue. And that's where our crews go straight for. Typically, like I said, it's a service issue and straight away we know the service within, I'd say, 99% accuracy of which service is the issue. If it's a main in leak, then obviously lots of sodos light up on that main it will be. It's not an exact science. It's not, we're never going to predict, you know, it's 30 centimetres from here. We'll all go, always go out with our crews and then do the final analysis. But so there's no need for, I guess, detailed triangulation at the back end. It's really obvious. as to where the, the hotspots are just from a, um, a heat map perspective, if that makes sense. Thanks, Andrew. That, that answers that really well. Uh, my next question concerns battery life. So uh, the sensor is obviously going to consume a degree of battery life. Can you give an idea, either of you, how much of the battery life uh, this sensor on board and integrated into the meter will consume um, or an estimate of it in all ordinary operations. And then in hot climates, uh, uh, there's some um, concerns about battery life for digital meters generally. So what, um, uh, what, what's, the, what, what's the correlation there with, uh, with hot climates? Yeah. Um, oh, Dan, I'll take this one. So Look, it's always interesting when we get to battery devices that need to spend a long time out in the field. Um, and, and, but battery technology has come a long way uh, from, from 20 years ago. And the types of batteries that are used in uh, our meters um, have specifically been tested and proven um, to withstand those environmental extremes. Um, both uh, in hot climates uh, and also the, the cooler climates. Uh, battery life itself um, partly is a function of environment, but also very much uh, more around a function of use. Um, and depending on how you may use the product, the regularity of data transmission um, from a frequency perspective um, or the amount of data will have an impact more on battery life. Um, we've developed our product with the mindset of the Soto network leak detection device being part of it. Um, and, and therefore the design has been built around that. And we're looking at, you know, a 15 year life in field um, in typical use um, in, in the different scenarios that you've, that uh, has been talked about. Um, obviously that, that life, as I said, is dependent on the frequency communication and adding different things and, and changing will have an impact on, on onto that life. Um, 
what we've seen typically is in the water companies from a business case perspective, uh, particularly as they move to digitalization and the benefits they're reaping, the, the business cases uh, you know, are around 10 to 12 years and anything beyond that uh, is, is a further increase. And so we well cover the business case uh, life scenarios that we're seeing in the marketplace uh, with, with that life of the battery that's in the current products. Um, I think to add to that over time and in the future, um, as battery technology even takes further leaps forward and the, the burden or, and design of the products improve, we could even see far more extended uh, battery life uh, in field. Um, that, that being said, you then need to balance that out with the ability of the product to deliver and the journey that we're all on um, with the technology that we bring. And I think as we've seen as an example in the electricity meter market, where we went from very uh, basic electronic product to sort of an AMR type product, a one-way communication to a very advanced technology, the water industry is benefiting by starting quite advanced from day one. Um, and so I think the, the smart meters we deploy today uh, have a long life and the battery is supporting that life um, to drive those business cases in a positive sense for the water companies. Good, thanks. Thanks, David. Andrew, did you want to add anything to that or? No, other than to say, Dan, that that's probably our expectation is that even with the advanced sensors and obviously to, to David's point, you have to manage them correctly. Um, you know, you can't turn them on all day, every day, et cetera. You need to, to be smart about how you do it. But yeah, our expectation is that sort of 15 year infield uh, battery life. And that's, that's, that's what we're sort of um, building our business case around. Great. Thank you. Next question is whether elements of the water supply pipeline, such as fittings, valves, or joints, may cause false readings uh, of leaks using this technology. And, you know, how prevalent are false readings generally? So I can talk to that one, Dan, if you like, and I'm not quite sure on, on sort of how they would give false reading. So obviously the sensor measures vibration at the meter, and so it will hear any noise. So if there is a, there's a baseline, so if under normal circumstances, you really quickly understand what the base noise that this meter hears, any deviation to that is obviously caused by something. And in most cases, it will be a leak. So the, the transient stuff, like if there's a tram track nearby or cars going by, that gets filtered out in the, in the smarts of the meter, et cetera, and, and the way the sampling's done. So if there's a persistent thing there, it's a real world noise that's occurring and it's persisting through the middle of the night every day. So it's really unlikely that you get false alarms from that. Where in the early days you could get what some people call a false alarm is usage on the customer side, either a leak or something you know crazy going on in, in the household where they're doing washing machines all through the night or something completely abnormal. You would that would that also gets picked up because it's a noise. But the meter now is smart enough to detect it. Actually, filters out when there's a noise when the flow is also running. So immediately you can associate an alarm from the Soto to say. okay, that is very much associated to the customer's side rather than the network. So you don't send people out looking for a network leak when it's something on the customer side. So to sort of answer your question, we don't see a lot in the way of false positives um, that aren't real world um, things, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and this could be for either Dave or Andrew. 1% uh, is really good for non-revenue water savings, uh, but there should be other non-tangible benefits, for example, for customers. Uh, what, has this been considered as part of the business case? So Dave, I can have a quick go at that. Um, you want to you, Andrew? Yeah. Yep. So, so there, there is some non-tangible stuff for sure. And it's not in the business case because I guess we're still learning this stuff, but, but some of the intangible things are, for example, warranties of repairs. So when is a repair done in a roadway and there's sodos around, um, we know for sure the quality of that repair based on the vibration that occurs. So in the previous or traditional way, you would never know the quality of repair potentially because once it's buried over, it may leak again in one month, six months, et cetera. As soon as the repair is done, the sodos just by being there, bring back what that um, 
you know, the noise is from that repair. And if it's not done to a certain quality, you can tell straight away. So having that sort of warranty and QA of, of, of pipe repairs, that's one that we definitely we weren't thinking about, but that's come to the fore a few times just from our trial. So that's that's probably a big one for, for me, Dan. And in terms of customer benefit, ultimately the, the customer are gonna get benefited by us doing our job more efficiently at a lower cost. And for them, it's about them not having to come out and, and have a soggy, um, nature strip and call us in and then everyone that walks past it also calls in a leak it's really you know inefficient ties up our contact center um we're going to make that experience seamless where we're out there doing repair we're aiming for um, andrew just to add to that uh, and maybe not a direct customer benefit but a more a customer societal benefit um with the digitization of, of the water network um, and the saving of water, how does that have a sort of a positive impact by the reduction of potentially some CO2 emissions? Because water companies have a significant energy, you know, electricity energy usage in, in, in driving the pressure through the pipes and pumping the water. Um, you know, is that a continued knock on effect that you could see as a benefit as well? Yeah, David, really interesting one. It, it definitely is. So there's a, on the network side, there is it, in the Melbourne and the Southeast. Water area, we're lucky that most of it is a gravity network, but we do have lots, still have lots of pumping and treatment, etc. So there's a component there. I think on the um, the other factor, I guess, and you touched on it, it's about the societal benefits, and, and I sort of won't get into it too much. But other than to say, if we can save all of this water, wasted water, non revenue water, it can potentially defer the next desalination augmentation, which in turn uh, reduces cost to our customers. So there's a whole economic piece. And the reason we're really driving this is because that is a societal benefit. If we don't, if we can't do that, then desal and other augmentations may get built, and those costs right. flow to us. So yeah. that's that's really the underpinning driver. And I think that's where, obviously, in different water companies, depending on how they they're pumping their water through the network, it will have a different benefit, potentially even a higher benefit in in some of those ones. Yeah. Um, to, to drive that more efficient uh, in, uh, efficient energy usage that they have as well. And so again, I think every water company, and we've got a number of them on the call today, we really need to think through their own uh, circumstances um, and, and, and see how that business case will drive uh, positively for them. Mm. Yeah, really good point, David. We do need to think about the, um, the energy footprint. Uh, Follow-up question for you, David. Um, uh, customers in Europe and particularly in Finland are interested in smart water meters and leak detection, but currently there is no market suppliers for our needs. Is the W350 plus SOTO sensor coming to Europe at some point? Um, look, I'm, I'm really pleased that, you know, uh, for that question. So thanks, Dan. Um, Landis and Gear being a global player, um, we, and I've said before that for Landis and Gear, Smart water is a strategic initiative for us globally, uh, not just here uh, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and with our, our partnership um, with our Southeast Water, we are able to take the technology uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, we have a very strong team uh, based out of uh, Nuremberg in Germany. Uh, in fact, we do a lot of development out of that for our battery and technology and also our ultrasonic water uh, measurement technology. And so that team will be bringing uh, these technologies to the market uh, in, in the near future. And so, yes, please, uh, you know, uh, whoever that may have been, please register and uh, we, we will be able to follow you up for that in, in Europe if, if you're from a Europe-based uh, utility there. Uh, so most definitely we would be keen to bring that to market. Yeah, good. Thanks, Dave. This is a question probably more broadly about MBIOT or um, the static meter. And Andrew, it's probably more for you, but what, what proportion of installs don't meet the kind of your operating um, uh, criteria, minimum criteria, and, uh, you know, possibly because of coverage holes in the telco network, et cetera? And um, have, have we... Or have you looked into an alternative um, comms approach where there is potentially a black hole in the telco coverage? 
Yeah, so Dan, obviously we haven't deployed across our entire network as yet, but but suffice to say, we've got three major telco providers all providing MBIoT and effectively the 4G footprint and beyond that because MB, the nature of MBIoT. And across our service area, we, we believe we'll have coverage everywhere is the expectation, um, probably with one or at, at least one carrier, but possibly a back, back up with the second. Um, depending on how what our strategy is there. So it's not a major concern. At the moment, we don't have any black spots at all in our rollout, but that said, I, we haven't tested it everywhere. I guess what we've got up our sleeve that electricity maybe didn't is that all the water meters are in densely populated areas. If you like, so we don't have any off-grid water customers that are away from down to Portsea and across to Gippsland and we have not had any issues in, in communications as you if we do come across them we'll cross that real real black spot that we could sorry Dan are you have I you got me back again yeah you're back there but maybe turn your sorry. camera off Andrew because it's um you are cutting in and out a bit Sorry, Dan. So I'm not sure how much of you got, but basically, long story short, was we think we've got it covered with the telcos that are in play now. If there's an absolute black spot that we can't meet for some reason, then obviously we'll look at an alternate technology. But that's not our a pressing need for us at the moment. Yeah, there's a and, and David, did you want to answer that or follow up on that? Yeah, I think there's a few things um, and Lennis and Gear. Uh, through some of our strategic global partnerships, we have a, a very strong partnership with Vodafone Global, uh, not to be confused by uh, any local carriers, where we can actually bring to market um, a, a product which we, we term as Seamless Connect. And this is a connectivity that goes with the, um, uh, with, with, with the MBIoT uh, modems in the products. Um, and what we are working with is it actually uh, will allow multiple carriers um, in, in the marketplace. Um, and we can offer this in, in, certain, in certain markets where we can actually have that coverage of the mul multiple carriers um, that, uh, that uh, Andrew was talking about uh, in a single SIM. And the meter will join the, the best network at the time um, in, in the marketplace. That's something that we are, uh, uh, are starting to work and, and actually have early deployments in New Zealand. Um, and as we progress with more carriers coming onto the system, uh, it will be something that we look forward to offering to the wider uh, markets in Australia and, and so forth. So that's again, another way of improving it. Um, I think the other thing that we obviously we look at as a, as a developer of technology is always to have ongoing improvements and you know every generation improving antenna connectivity uh, in, in improving um, signal strength uh, to improve those connectivities in those applications or to introduce in certain circumstances um, additional accessories um, such as potentially passive uh, antenna repeaters that if a, if a meter is in a certain location where it can't get connectivity, we bring the connectivity to it. Um, and so we're working in a number of different areas to ensure that um, meters can be registered onto the network. Yeah, great. Thanks, um, thanks, David. Uh, there's a follow-up question as well. With a 15-year battery slash asset life out in the field, uh, are we all confident that, and using a telco MBIOT network, are we confident that telco is going to guarantee um, connectivity for that period of time as well? Yeah, uh, Dan, a very good question. Um, and look, uh, I can't speak for all carriers, but uh, again, I come back to what Landis and Gear offers with our partnership with, with Vodafone Global. Uh, under Seamless Connect, uh, we can guarantee that, uh, and we do uh, with our customers. Uh, and this is something not just for Australia and New Zealand, but we, we offer Seamless Connect both in Europe and North America. And we have many millions of endpoints in, in uh, the electricity uh, meter space. Uh, already under contract uh, with the multi-carrier and 15-year and life uh, guarantee. And so we hope to bring that same guarantee to the marketplace here uh, as well. 
um, MBIT as a technology in itself and the carriers give a long life uh, for that uh, uh, in the marketplace. Um, with Landis and Gear Seamless Connect, we can, we can guarantee that for our customers. Andrew, did you have anything as a as a customer or a utility? Is that a concern for for Southeast Water? Uh, look, Dan, it's something we definitely assessed as part of our tech selection. But I guess if you look back on it, two G lasted twenty five to thirty years. Three G only getting turned off this year or last, so it lasts about seventeen odd years. I think with four G underpinning five G and where that's going to take with ve autonomous vehicles and all the rest, I think we'll easily get the fifteen years. Beyond that. Don't know. It'll be a new technology and a new meter fleet, whatever that looks like. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, I'm really confident that we'll get the 15 years. No yeah, problem. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, it's maybe the last question, depending on the answers, but um, uh, have you been able to confirm the, um, uh, the quantify the benefits of reducing disturbances to, to customers during maintenance events? Um, via, you know, more planned uh, works rather than reactive works? Is there any quantifiable um, benefit in the business case around, around that? Yeah, so Dan, the, hopefully you hear me all right. But yeah, there is. Um, we've got components in there to say, we're not trying to do it where we say it's going to take, you know, 10 minutes off each call, et cetera. We're, we're doing it where potentially we can change our contact center model. Um, so when it gets to a point where you don't need as many people, et cetera, then, then it has a material impact on the business case. So yes, we've definitely quantified that um, as best we can based on the evidence we have so far. Yep. Mm. Excellent. And I think with a lot of customer benefits, it is difficult to quantify what um, what that means from a satisfaction perspective and track that against the utility satisfaction metrics. But um, intuitively, it makes sense that if you can plan those types of maintenance works at night uh, and minimise disturbance, or if it's during the day and, and they're not there um, and the water's off, then, um, you know, those things will be um, less concerning than, um, than reactive works. So, um, that's uh, yeah. That's that's a fairly obvious benefit. Um, uh, there's been a lot of well. There's a lot of questions more than we can possibly address in the time. Um, so we will seek to respond to those questions that we can um, individually to people. Um, but there's been a, a fair few questions around how the sensor integrates into the meter, um, and some that may indicate that. Um, uh, certainly some of the audience members don't fully appreciate that the vibration sensor is fully integrated inside the meter. It's not an external um, uh, device. It is uh, fully integrated into a whole digital meter, which, um, which would replace a current mechanical meter. Um, and so it benefits and piggybacks off the battery that already sits in the uh, digital meter and also the comms chip that already sits in there. So it is a uh, an edge device essentially and sits out at the edge of the network and listens into the network. Um, for network leaks, um, they're in all of these static digital meters, they also have inbuilt um, some kind of alarm that enables the water utility to identify a leak in the customer side of, of, um, of the network. So that is typically not the utility's responsibility after the meter, uh, but if you can monitor a leak in the customer side of the network, um, why wouldn't you uh, inform your customer to let them know that they may get a really big shock at their next bill uh, but also they're, um, they're losing X, um, potentially losing X litres of water through a leak and that that may cost them Y dollars um, a week if they don't, um, if they don't uh, get that. So maybe um, uh, hopefully that explains uh, the situation. So your base digital meter will find the customer leak. The base digital meter plus the SOTO will do that plus find a leak in the network. Maybe it's a good opportunity if... Andrew, you just want to talk quickly about um, what we're doing or what Southeast Water is doing in the space of um, customer leaks on the customer side? 
Yeah, so um, as you just you pointed out nicely there, Dan, yeah, the, the meter takes care of finding a customer leak. And what we do, we instantly notify customers depending on the severity of that leak. So we classify it as small or large, and that dictates how quickly we message them. So for a really small leak, we might send it if it continues for two days, for example. If it's a medium or large leak, we'll, we'll notify them straight away. At the moment, we're telling them sort of what the impact is to their bills, et cetera. And we're already seeing a great turnaround in, in terms of people fixing that. I think the next stage for us is to make that a seamless process where you get a text message and then rather than having to um, hunt around for plumbers, et cetera, maybe we'll turnkey that whole solution and make it a, a really optimal experience. But that, that's down the track. But so far, leak detection has been the clear uh, winner for us with digital meters. It's I think we're tracking around 7% of properties that have had a leak of, of some magnitude. And some have really surprised us because whilst we haven't covered our whole area, we've, we've had leaks in our effectively trials where people have had major leaks under their house that would have caused damage to the house and given them a huge bill. So, and that's happened on a few occasions. So you can only imagine what we're going to find. So, so far, a really good experience. Yeah, good. Thank you. Dave, did you want to add anything to that? I just think it reiterates the digital transformation benefits, right, for, for consumers. Uh, and obviously, as consumers can be more informed, um, they can take corrective action uh, for, their, for their own leaks in their, in their property. Um, mm. And I think what that, that sort of uh, segues into is that as water uh, companies go on a digital transformation, their internal processes need to match that digital transformation. That you'll need to change and adapt new ways. And obviously here, it's a, a new way of having a closer and an, uh, engagement uh, with their customers, uh, an improved engagement with their customers on the back end of a technology that is mainly, I guess, if we think about the subject today around the network leak detection is mainly for the utility company itself, but there's a back end uh, uh, positive for the, the consumers as well. Mm. Well, look, we might wrap that up there and apologies to any of the, um, the listeners if their questions didn't get addressed, but we'll do our best to, to do that later. Um, I think just as a basic summary to, to wrap up, uh, non-revenue water is uh, going to be increasingly a, a big problem for uh, water utilities as they encounter more challenging environment, both economically, um, customers, customers struggle with affordability, um, but also environmental concerns become um, the expectations around what is an acceptable level of non-revenue water and uh, the utility's social license to operate really starts coming into question. And I, I was really surprised with that whole concept of an economic level of, of leakage. Um, I recognise there's some that, that just it's not possible to get at, but um, we're hoping that, that, that with this technology, that level of what is an economic, economic or uh, acceptable level of leakage comes down significantly. And 1% um, reduction is, is, I think, quite a conservative point, but um, we are really excited about, um, about introducing this technology uh, to South East Water, but also around, um, around uh, uh, ANZ market and then globally, because we uh, believe it is a game-changing technology. Um, uh, I would just like to thank everyone that participated in this and um, submitted questions, particularly like to thank David McLean and Andrew Force tonight for your time and your, your candour and really um, sincerely hope that it's been able to shed further light on, on this important topic and it does provide another option in the toolkit for water utilities to tackle non-revenue water. I think probably the main, all, all approaches are valid um, and it really is a horses for courses, but uh, this is uh, a solution that, that can be applied at scale and provides a permanent, um, not just leak detection, but leak location um, solution when, when partnered with um, you know, a basics analytics platform. Um, it's a uh, good time with this webinar because of Oswater. I hope everyone's going to Oswater next week. Um, Lannis and Gear will have a stand, as will um, Iota and Southeast Water. So please don't be um, afraid to come up and 
uh, uh, talk to us about um, about this solution and its application uh, in the email that follows this webinar. We'll provide um, further information on where we are and in the Oswater Pavilion, our stand. But um, we'll also provide a copy of the um, of the recording of this uh, this webinar um, and uh, and perhaps some key points. So, just like to wrap that up now and and thank everyone for um, for your time.